After two weeks on Cromwell and the monasteries, we return to the second part of the religion of Thomas Cromwell. Those previous two lectures might seem to have minimized Cromwell's contribution to the English Reformation. He had no master plan for dissolving monasteries. His personal preferences and actual strategy mirrored his proceedings under Cardinal Wolsey and the momentum repeatedly came from fitful interventions from King Henry VIII. Nor, in the end, did all the corporations that had been monasteries disappear. But uh, there is more to say about Cromwell and his religion. And to do that, we're going to go backwards and pick up the story from where we left it in the crisis of Cardinal Wolsey's power in summer 1529. Now that was a moment of betrayal, both of Wolsey and of the king by the Pope. At the hearing of the king's petition for the annulment of his arrogant marriage, uh, held in the London Blackfriars, Cardinal Wolsey's fellow judge, uh, Cardinal Campeggio, made it clear that no judgment on the case could be made in England that summer. Queen Catherine, had the chance to appeal directly to Rome, therefore, where the case could, as, case could last as long as the Vatican wanted. The Pope, in other words, had fooled King Henry, and Wolsey would take the blame. And as the worst crisis of his life so far moved towards this dire extremity, Thomas Cromwell put his affairs in order. On the 12th of July, 1529, as the Blackfriars trial meandered through the illusion of progress, Cromwell began making his will. Though circumstances dictated that neither this nor any other will would ever be put into effect. Its text, however, remains, and it's a precious snapshot of his affairs and his status at that time, though he made changes over the next year or two as circumstances changed. Tragic new circumstances, for instance, were the deaths of his two daughters, probably in late 1529, noted by erasures and substitutions in the will. His wife, Elizabeth, was already dead by the time that the neat, formal first text was drawn up. And there's been frequent remark on how traditional the religious reference of Cromwell's will appears. It opens with an unusually florid commendation of his soul to God, Our Lady, and the other saints. Stipulates in the end seven, substituted for three years of chantry prayers for his soul, and makes a sort of bequest to London's five friaries and to poor prisoners in city jails that you expect in the wills of particularly de devout late medieval folk with plenty of spare cash. Well, What's it all about? There are two feasible explanations. First, it might just be a smokescreen for the benefit of London diocesan officials. The future of uh, Cromwell's son, Gregory, and his little daughters was at stake, amid stirrings in the city about heresy, many involving his friends. His tolerant master was perhaps not around for much longer to protect him. The last thing would be to step demonstratively out of line in matters of public religious profession. But it's also possible that the shock of his wife's death disposed Cromwell to think more kindly of traditional provision for souls for the time being. He remained a widower for life, rejecting friendly promptings for a remarriage. Then followed the deaths of his daughters, his hopes of a family succession hung on the life of his son Gregory, who appears to have been physically small and maybe delicate as a boy. The prayers of priests and grateful recipients of charity might seem a reasonable investment. Well, this tr trimming of Cromwell's convictions or genuine change of devotional mood seems to have continued in the next few months uh, after the summer. 
In a well-known story, Wolsey's servant and biographer George Cavendish found his fellow servant in the great chamber at Isha, Wolsey's palace, on All Hallows' Day, 1st of November, 1529. Cromwell, George Cavendish says, was leaning in the great window with a primer in his hand, saying of Our Lady Matins, which had been a strange sight in him afore, which would have been a strange sight in him before. Now that's the reading in various manuscripts of Cavendish's work, but it was rejected by the 19th century editor, uh, George Samuel Singer, as not making sense. It doesn't sound like Cromwell. And so he preferred the alternative in other manuscripts, which had been since a very strange sight. But it's likely to be the better reading, the Difficilio Lectio. And the other one is an early manuscript correction, trying to make sense of it. Our Lady Matins, which had been a strange sight in him afore. In other words, Cavendish knew his man. And what he was saying was that Crummel was up to that moment known as a precocious evangelical. That fits what we've already seen of Crummel's dealings at Oxford and Poffley and with Miles Coverdale, to name no others, in the mid to late 1520s. So all this is suggesting that waver in 29. In any case, that All Hallows Day, Cromwell was in a highly emotional state, the tears upon his cheeks, lamenting that he was like to lose all that I have travelled for, all the days of my life, for doing my master true and diligent service, and saying that he was in disdain with most men for my master's sake. He told Cavendish of his resolve, however. I intend, God willing, this afternoon, when my lord hath dined, to ride to London, and so to the court, where I will either make or mar, ere I come again. Cavendish goes on to record events later that same evening, after dinner at Isha, less frequently quoted than that rather well-known story I've just quoted back to you, but equally significant. After dinner, Cromont was making an extended farewell to the Cardinal. He took his cue from Wolsey's commendations of his gentlemen and yeomen to suggest that he ought to consider their truth and loyal service. Wolsey replied sadly that his resources to reward them had gone. But Cromwell pointedly contrasted the lack of reward for these lay folk with generous financial rewards in spiritual promotions enjoyed by Wolsey's fleet of chaplains. Yet hath your poor servants taken much more pains for you in one day than all your idle chaplains hath done in a year. Emotionally reacting to this challenge, Wolsey summoned his household, clergy and lay folk, and on Cromwell's prompting, backed by an initial contribution of cash from Cromwell's own purse, forced his chaplains to hand over as much money as they could to his secular attendants. After this and prolonged private communication, Cromwell took his leave of his master and rode to London that night. Cavendish again repeated that vivid phrase, apparently a favourite of Cromwell's, to make or mar. Now, Cromwell was, uh, Cavendish was constructing a much more artful biographical narrative than is often acknowledged. And he would see the significance of that confrontation at Isha that evening. It demonstrated both Cromwell's loyalty to Wolsey and his antipathy to the generality of clergy. Not just the chaplains surrounding the cardinal, plus those like Stephen Gardner who had already ratted off, but also those clerics, mostly bastions of traditional religion, who deeply resented Wolsey's imperious ways and rejoiced as his power tottered, right up to Archbishop Wareham of Canterbury. Cromwell's attitude shaped royal policy for a whole decade thereafter, as churchmen found themselves relieved of unprecedented amounts of wealth for the benefit of lay people. Cromwell combined that long-standing quiet resentment of clergy with his infant evangelical convictions to craft a decade-long programme of revolution for Henry VIII's kingdom. Over the next year, however, Cromwell nevertheless continued making some surprisingly conservative noises. 
From Easter 1530, his master, the Cardinal, was in Northern England, making a reality of his tenure as Archbishop of York. And Cromwell was his agent down in London, doing his best to save Wolsey from further harm, which often meant saving Wolsey from himself. Several of his letters to the Cardinal survived, though some only in abbreviated summaries made in the 1620s by Lord Herbert of Charbury's research assistant, Thomas Master. Now, these were taken from state papers now lost, probably in the fire which devastated the Cottonian manuscripts in 1731. And in this uh, fragmentary correspondence between Cardinal and Servant, which Thomas Master saw and summarised, are two remarkable items. One letter startled Thomas Master and still remains startling. In Master's summary, Cromwell told the Cardinal he had discovered lately some who favour Luther's sect, and read his books, and Tyndall. The books he hath taken, that's Cromwell, the books Cromwell hath taken are the revelation of Antichrist and supplication of beggars, pestiferous books, and able, if they be scattered among the common people, to destroy the whole obedience and policy of this realm. Rommel exhorts the cardinal to stay this doctrine, stop this doctrine. Actually, only the first of those items was by William Tyndall, and that, that a largely a translation of a text by Luther. The second was by the anti-clerical pamphleteer Simon Fish. Now, the temptation, of course, is to think that Thomas Master had misattributed this letter, but a further letter to Wolsey, certainly from Cromwell, is equally strong. After warnings about money and the Cardinal's verbal indiscretions, Cromwell turned to supplying London news. He told the Cardinal that the King had summoned bishops and learned men to purge the realm of heretical books. And in reporting what was in fact an inaccurate rumour that Luther is departed this life, added the emphatic comment, I would he had never been born. Now, there are several ways of interpreting these sentiments. Cromwell may have been saying what Henry VIII ordered him to say, or what the Cardinal would expect and want to hear. The correspondents would also be aware that the chief champion of Tyndall and Fish and Luther, close to the king, was Wolsey's nemesis and Cromwell's coming enemy, Anne Boleyn. It's worth avoiding the hindsight to force all evangelicals in these early confused days of the Reformation into a seamless web of solidarity. I hope that's clear by now. Cromwell's first encounter with the movement which swelled into the Reformation was on his own testimony, as I uh, said in my first lecture, not through Luther, but through Erasmus, whom the world had seen bitterly clashing with Luther in the 1520s on the vital matter of human free will versus divine determinism. Cromwell remained a strong admirer of Erasmus, promoting translations, publications of his works by his various favoured printers during his years of power. Now, of course, unequivocally in the interests of evangelical reformation. But even for a reformer who enjoyed sneering at papal power, it was possible to blame Luther for splitting Christendom. Cromwell again wrote to Wolsey on the 18th of August, 1530, and he told him of current affairs in Germany, and he used the phrase, the Lutheran sect. And in the 16th century, there were few greater put-downs than the word sect. If again, you argue that this is language tailored to the recipient, it's worth noting that Cromwell's old servant, the vigorously evangelical Stephen Vaughan, also commonly called Luther's associates in reports to Cromwell on his foreign travels, the Lutheran sect. And Vaughan was much less inclined to dissembling to anybody, uh, let alone his master. No one scrabbling to do the king's will as desperately as Cromwell soon was in the annulment business would have any cause to love Luther, who was bitterly opposed to Henry VIII's repudiation of Queen Catherine. If he was looking for evangelical soulmates over the water in that cause, it would be to the reformers of Switzerland, who proved much more amenable to Henry VIII's arguments that he'd never so far been married at all and we will return to Switzerland. 
Nevertheless, pulling together various fragments, as I've just done for you, in 1529 to 1530, it's possible to suggest that this great crisis of Cromwell's fortunes did produce a serious jolt to his evangelical convictions, certainly in how he was present, prepared to present himself to the world. First, those traditionalist provisions in his will, then his lady Salter clutched at Isha, now exclamations at Luther. Add to that the group of Wolsey's friends and Anne's enemies who successfully promoted Cromwell to Henry VIII, no evangelical sim sympathizers there. And you might add in the circumstance of the one illegitimate child he is known to have fathered, a daughter called Jane. Now, the date is very uncertain of her birth, but on the balance of chronology, this is the most likely moment that it happened. Collectively, it does look like a real lurch in his behaviour, resembling nothing else in the record before or after these 12 months, which, of course, would have destroyed him with his old master if things had not fallen differently. Well, the wobble was soon passed, and Anne Bullen and Cromwell found themselves on the same side in religion. 1531 was a decisive year in forcing people to make theological choices in an increasingly obvious religious division, whatever they thought about the king's annulment plans, though no one could ever accuse King Henry VIII of making a theological decision. But others did, Stephen Gardner, Thomas Moore, Reginald Poole, all opted for the traditionalist side of the new religious divide. Cromwell's actions unmistakably moved back to the evangelical patterns we saw in the 1520s, and that brought him close to one enthusiastic supporter and client of Anne Bullen, Thomas Cranmer, soon to be Archbishop of Canterbury. From now on, Cromwell and Cranmer enjoyed an intimate cooperation which went well beyond business. Their relationship had evolved over four years or so from the first time they apparently met, which was involving, uh, being involved in setting up Cardinal College Ipswich. Now, a general, genuine trust, affection, overcame the delicacy of their allegiances to two conflicting patrons. A pair of ideals united them even though the ideals were themselves ultimately incompatible. Loyalty to King Henry and the furthering of evangelical reformation. Well, in view of Henry's capricious attitude to theology and frequent religious traditionalism, it was never going to be an easy combination to manage. On the matter of religion, Cranmer could always write in an unbuttoned fashion to his colleague about promoting the gospel and godliness and things like that. But there was a marked difference between them. Cranmer was totally unwavering in his enthusiasm for the cause. He was a recent convert, and so for him, the world was divided into strivers after truth and deluded or depraved followers of Antichrist though his gentle, thoughtful disposition meant he could always hope that the deluded might be persuaded to follow, follow a path of righteousness. He was, after all, a predestinarian and believed that God would guide those he decreed for salvation into the right way. His household and the clergy associated with it were consistently aggressive in their evangelicalism. Each promotion of Cranmer's clients was a little pinprick against false teaching of the Roman church and there was no comfort for those of traditionalist religious outlook for, from him. Cromwell was both more flexible and more ruthless than Cranmer. It was all very well for a priest and a former Cambridge don to enjoy his ideological purity. The politician was managing a much more complex job, doing the dirty political work he was sparing Cranmer. The Archbishop only really learned the art of political survival when he had to, after Cromwell was brought to the scaffold in 1540. In subsequent crises, Cranmer did acquire a hard-headed toughness in public life, which only met its match in the wholly unexpected national reversal of direction on Edward VI's death. In tussling with the growing pile of business on his desk, Cromwell had much to weigh up and balance beyond the concern of his high-minded colleague in Lambeth Palace. 
Now, we saw in my first lecture that Cromwell's picaresque life, his club ability, had brought him plenty of traditionalist-minded friends. Not only folk from Putney days, up the social scale as far as Bishop West of Ely, but a throng of convivial relationships which he'd acquired under Cardinal Wolsey. And that latter group had provided the main supporters for his entrance into the King's service. I hope that proved enough now. Only a fool would have abandoned such good friends now, and it's arguable that only a knave betrays friendships solely to promote an idea. In any case, Cromwell's theological radicalism perhaps not only outstripped that of the Archbishop of Canterbury, but also outran what would ever be possible to change in Henry's realm. This is the end and also the ultimate legacy of his extraordinary decade of power, and it will need careful unravelling, which I now propose to do. Now, to understand Cromwell's mature, mature religion and its long-term implications, we need to step back even further in time to the early 1520s. Cardinal Wolsey was not actually Cromwell's first prominent English employer. That was another Thomas, Thomas Gray, second Marquis of Dorset. Not much correspondence survives from this episode in Cromwell's career, and two crucial items have been misdated, which have much muddied the waters over the years. And it, all that has caused commentators to pass over Cromwell's employment by the Greys. What does remain confirms that he was not just some legal consultant to the Marquis of Dorset, but actually in his household. He was the go-between for private correspondence between the Marquis and the Marchioness of Dorset, also with the Marquis's younger brother, Lord George Grey, and he acted at the beck and call of their mother, the Dowager Marchioness Sicily, to move around household, household stuff for her. Now, one reason that this service with the Greys has been ignored is that it lasted no longer than a year, which might lead us to suppose that the relationship cooled, or at any rate, ceased to be of significance, but not so. His brother-in-law, Morgan Williams, continued to serve in the Marquis's household, and Morgan's son, Richard, whom Cromwell virtually adopted as his own son in the 1530s, was also in the Marquis's service. Quite apart from that, there's a skein of connections between Cromwell himself and the Greys all through these years, including an extraordinarily cordial note from Lord George Grey of 1527 or 1528 addressed to my fellow and friend, Master Thomas Cromwell, which is a remarkable form of address to a former menial servant who'd been moving around his mother's wardrobe only two or three years before. Even more remarkable is the letter of 1526 uh, from a further brother of the Marquis of Dorset, Lord John Grey, in which he calls Cromwell Brother Cromwell. Can't understand that. It remains to be unravelled. But it's there, Brother Cromwell. The Greys were not slow to call on their former servant in his steadily increasing good fortune as he entered royal service in the 1530s. In 1532, the second Marquis of Dorset's brother, Lord Leonard Grey, hope you're following all these Greys, Lord Leonard Grey enlisted Cromwell in what turned out to be an unsuccessful quest to marry a rich Lincolnshire widow. Amid promises of handsome reward, Lord Leonard Grey emphasised to his loving friend and fellow that my whole trust next to the king is in you. In the mid-1530s, this relationship became entangled in Cromwell's interventionist policies in Ireland, when Cromwell engineered the appointment of Lord Leonard Grey as the King's Lord Deputy in Dublin. Not a great success, admittedly. The Grey connections ramify the more one looks for them. Look for footnotes. One important reason for the lack of attention to Cromwell's intimate relationship with the Greys is an accident of history. Thomas Marquis of Dorset died on the 10th of October 1530, just too early to help Thomas Cromwell extract himself from the aftermath of Cardinal Wolsey's fall, or to become his ally at court during the 1530s. Now, the Marquis's son, Henry, the third Marquis of Dorset, was then a young teenager. And so 
Henry himself remained of no practical account in politics through the rest of Cromwell's career. But we should notice that this actually resulted in Cromwell taking on a crucial role in the affairs of the Greys. Cromwell clearly got on very well with the second Marquess's widow, Margaret. She was born one of the Wootons of Kent, part of his gentry network in that county. In the early 1530s, he sorted out for the now dowager marchioness the misgovernment of the Cistercian Abbey of Tilty in Essex. Uh, that was important because Tilty was the marchioness's home. The Greys, in their role of, as founder family of Tilty Abbey, had annexed its guest house in the 1520s as their main residence in the south. Cromwell later arranged a very early and discreet surrender of Tilty Abbey in 1536 before any general legislation on monastic dissolution. That was one of those uh, uh, single dissolutions of which I spoke last time. He used his nephew, the Marchioness's former servant, Richard Cromwell, as the agent in this dissolution. The Grey's steward at Tilty Abbey was one Henry Sadler, whose son was Rafe Sadler, one of Cromwell's most reliable and trusted servants. Henry Sadler was himself a good friend of Cromwell and of Richard Cromwell, alias Williams. Uh, Richard Cromwell was probably much the same age as Rafe. They must have known each other as boys. Most remarkable of all was the widowed Marchioness of Dorset's tribute to Cromwell when the young teenager Marquis was launched at court in 1534. He's about 14. And the Marchioness begged Cromwell to look after him. Whenever you shall see in him any large gambling or great usual swearing or any other demeanour unmeet for him to use, which I fear me shall be very often, then it may please you, good Master Cromwell, for my late lord, his good father's sake, who so God pardon, in some friendly fashion to rebuke him. And so Master Secretary, a long way now from Putney, was being asked to step into the role of a father for one of England's senior peers. Now this is not of mere anecdotal significance. For it needs to be remembered that this teenager in need of a firm paternal hand, then Marquis of Dorset by inheritance, later gained the even more exalted title Duke of Suffolk. In that capacity, Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk, tried in 1553 to father a new royal dynasty through his ill-fated daughter, Lady Jane Grey. Now, given the Grey family's long sustained and intimate links to Cromwell, which I've just laid out for you, we need to ask how in the 1550s, the Greys became the chief sponsors of the Edwardian Reformation's decisive links to Heinrich Bullinger, chief pastor of the great Protestant Swiss city of Zurich. No one ever seems to have asked why that should be, and how the Greys ended up with this fateful and historically decisive connection to the newly established Protestant church in the Swiss city of Zurich. Zurich has become so much part of the story of the English Reformation that it has ceased to seem an anomaly. This was a city that had no natural links through trade or politics with England during the 1530s. Why Zurich? And how does Cromwell fit into the story? This link to Zurich moved the course of English religion not merely to the Protestant Reformation, but towards a particular strand within it that King Henry VIII unquestionably considered obnoxiously heretical. Cromwell didn't originate this initiative, which to begin with heavily implicated Archbishop Cranmer, but in his characteristically improvisatory fashion, Cromwell sustained the enterprise when theological considerations checked Cranmer's enthusiasm. He did so in ways that have left a permanent mark on the Church of England and its various world offshoots to the present day. Put simply, the move to embrace Zurich turned English Protestantism's path away from Lutheranism, and towards what became the reformed Protestant family of churches. 
This move we can trace back to the year 1536. And the first stirrings in what I'm afraid will be a complex story came from Strasbourg and its far-seeing chief pastor Martin Butzer, keenly interested in the progress of an English diplomatic mission led by Bishop Fox to the Lutheran Military Alliance, the Schmalkaldic League. Strasbourg was Protestant, but it was not a member of the League. Its Protestantism did not look to Martin Luther and Saxony, but south and west to the cities of the Empire and Switzerland, taking their cue from a different and indeed rival reformer, Ulrich Zwingli, chief pastor of Protestant Zürich until his death in 1531. And there was no escaping the painful fact that the two Protestant blocs had disagreed very quickly on fundamental issues. Most importantly, Luther, like the Pope and Henry VIII, believed that in the Mass, bread and wine became the body and blood of Christ, though he dis disagreed with the Pope and the King as to how this miracle happened. By contrast, the Swiss and the South Germans saw this liturgical drama as the Lord's Supper, a memorial of Christ's great sacrifice on the cross, mystically symbolized only in bread and wine, which remained bread and wine still. There was one huge disagreement straight away. The Southerners also abhorred idolatry, by which they principally meant sacred images in churches. Luther, after some thought, decided that the issue was unimportant and he let most images stand in his church buildings and there they are today in Lutheran churches in Scandinavia and North Germany. Even the music of the two groupings differed. To a toleration of traditional Latin church music and pipe organs, Luther added his own freshly composed hymns, usually to new tunes. The Southerners considered all this on the edge of idolatry. Indeed, Zurich abolished all music in churches and kept the ban right up to the 1590s. Other communities which in general followed Zurich didn't go that far, they got bored without music, but still they only allowed their congregations biblical music, by which they principally meant the 150 psalms increasingly sung in metre. Even Luther's Protestant hymns were beyond the pale for the Reformed. Well, you can see that this is a formidable chasm between two Protestantisms, and it crystallized in mid-century into two hostile camps with names to identify them, Lutherans and the Reformed, both Protestants but irredeemably at odds, and in many parts of the world they still are. They hated each other as much as they hated the Pope. Well, that was in the future, but the gulf was already wide in the 1530s, and in Strasbourg, Martin Butzer was anxious to bridge it, encouraging a series of dialogues. His efforts ultimately founded both on Luther's unwillingness to see anyone else's point of view and Butzer's own inability to think of simply expressed ways of doing theology. But Butzer did try, and at no time did he try harder than in 1536. England became part of his plans, a whole kingdom that had broken with the Pope. He launched a charm offensive with books, dedicating his own books to Thomas Cranmer and to the English ambassador to Protestant Germany, Edward Fox. Butzer even issued a special edition of Bishop Stephen Gardner's Defense of the Royal Supremacy, De Vera Obedientia, with Butzer's own preface full of lavish praise of Gardner, events were to mock that particular olive branch. Closely following Butzer's literary, uh, literary diplomacy was the current chief pastor of Zürich, Heinrich Bullinger, Zwingli's successor, a man with as keen a nose for international contacts as Butzer himself. On the face of it, Zürich was even less promising as a continental partner for England than Butzer's Strasbourg. Strasbourg was, at least, a great international commercial centre, enjoying frequent contacts with London. But there really were no natural links between the valleys of the Thames and the Limmat. The only possible asset was a personal relationship based on religious sympathy. 
Bolinger persuaded Simon Grineus, a Basel academic who'd already introduced Butzer to Cranmer, to effect an introduction for him, by letter, of course. Out of this, a literary friendship blossomed between Bullinger and Cranmer. They used evangelical publishers or printers of London and Zurich as unobtrusive envoys in the course of their business in the book trade. Over the next 12 months into 1537, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote to Bullinger in remarkably relaxed style. You might even call it indiscreet. But most remarkable fruit of these manoeuvres came early in 1536, a journey by three enthusiastically evangelical young Englishmen, Nicholas Partridge, John Butler, and William Woodroffe, and they were to spend a long educational visit in that faraway Swiss city, Zurich. Some in England would consider this destination suspect, so the public story was that they were off to explore Italy. But they arrived in Zurich in August 1536, probably setting out, therefore, from England in July, or something like that. And the visit was a huge success. Bullinger took a keen personal interest in them, helped the young men settle into advanced biblical study in the city. And it became reciprocal when Bullinger's 18-year-old adopted son, Rudolf Gwalter, arrived in England in spring 1537, chaperoned by Partridge and Woodroffe to Magdalen College, Oxford. Gwalter's two-month stay left him with golden memories for the rest of his life's work as chief pastor of Zurich in the 1560s and 70s. He returned to Switzerland in company with Partridge and three more young Englishmen, and yet another appeared in Zurich a few months later. English Protestantism benefited hugely, particularly when Zurich warmly welcomed Protestant exiles in Mary Tudor's reign. Now, it would be easy to read all this as Archbishop Cranmer's initiative, and that's what I assumed, actually, when I wrote my biography of Cranmer. Certainly, uh, until the summer of 1536, he was chief apparent actor in creating England's evangelical axis to Strasbourg and Zurich. Yet the pioneering student exchange, as I pedantically just pointed out to you, came after that, uh, July, August 1536. And if you start ferreting into the origins and connections of the young Englishmen, it's striking how little they were linked to Cranmer and how much they were linked to Thomas Cromwell. Those with a university connection came from Oxford, not Cambridge. Cranmer's connections were all the other way. Magdalen College, of which Nicholas Partridge was a fellow, was prominent in most of their stories. And it was already a battleground between evangelicals and conservatives, battles in which Thomas Cromwell had intervened in the evangelical, in the evangelical side in 1535. Out beyond that, a whole web of associations bind Cromwell to the young men, too rich and complex to bore you with on this occasion. Because the most persuasive evidence comes from the detail of Rudolf Gwalter's visit to England in 1537. Being both conscientious and Swiss, he kept a diary of this exciting and exotic trip, complete with accomplished sketch maps. After a grim Calais-Dover crossing, Walter's idyll began among Nicholas Partridge's gentry relatives in Kent. Then a sequence of distinguished hosts up to Archbishop Cranmer at Lambeth Palace. First, Sir Edward Wootton, and in London, Wootton's brother-in-law, Lord John Grey. This was the same Lord John Grey, who back in 1526 had so singularly saluted Cromwell as his brother. And the common factor here was Margaret Wootton, Dowager Marchioness of Dorset, Thomas Cromwell's former employer, employer and Sir Edward Wootton's brother, uh, sister, sister. Further warm hospitality from Lord John Grey and Cranmer enlivened the journey back to a much easier channel crossing from Margate. While in Kent, Gwalter enjoyed an antiquarian tour of Leeds Castle, lately home in succession to Cromwell's friends, Sir Henry and Edward Guildford. Throughout all this, one senses a friendly absence of the unifying personality behind it all, the Lord Privy Seal, my Lord Cromwell. 
It was natural and politic that Bullinger, as chief clergyman of the city of Zurich, should make his approaches and sustain open friendship with the chief clergyman of the Kingdom of England, Thomas Cranmer. Cromwell would have been ill-advised to show open involvement. And the importance of keeping out of the limelight in regard to the Swiss exchange was underlined by what happened next. Walter went happily back to Switzerland, and in his scrip was a, a collection of letters uh, from Cranmer to various Swiss grandees, not uh, notable clergy, one appropriately, of course, to Bullinger, but another to be forwarded to the city of St. Gallen and its chief reformer, Joachim Vadianus. Now, Vadianus, when he opened eagerly this uh, letter from a great clergyman far away, would have been disconcerted by the contents. It was a thank you note for his present of Vadianus's theological aphorisms from 1536. But actually, it was a hatchet job on the Eucharistic theology contained in the book. Cranmer found Vadianus's remembrance view of the Eucharist unacceptable, and he said so at length. Thus, Cranmer, like his royal master, and like Luther, still at this stage vigorously affirmed the real presence in the Eucharist against the Swiss and the Strasburgers. Not long afterwards, Cranmer sent an equally astringent reply to another literary overture from Butzer's colleague uh, as Strasbourg pastor, Wolfgang Capito. And this was even more serious because Capito had de dedicated his book to King Henry VIII. And after having had it read and analysed for him, the king sees just as sharply as Cranmer on its statements about the Eucharist. Well, Cranmer did not thereafter totally end contacts with Zurich, Zurich, but he was much more circumspect, indeed deliberately slow in letter writing. And it wasn't until after King Henry's death in 1546 that Cranmer felt able to abandon his scholarly caution about the Eucharist the removing, the removing, I think, of the terrifying charisma of the king allowed him to make the leap across the theological divide, embrace the symbolist view of the Eucharist that Zwingli had pioneered. But still, Zurich was never high on Cranmer's priorities across the sea, certainly compared with Strasbourg. In the meantime, however, the overseas contacts continued without him. And the young men from 1536 to 38 continued in their wanderings, their warm correspondence with their friends across the water. Gwalter even planned a second trip to England in 1540, though Cromwell's fall intervened before that could happen. Even despite Rudolf Gwalter's disappointment in 1540, in Edward VI's reign, a procession of talented foreign scholars and theologians followed his footsteps from Zurich to Oxford, Oxford note, and they played a significant part in counteracting the still powerful conservatism of this university. Their consistent patrons were the Marchioness of Dorset's son, Henry Grey, now Duke of Suffolk, plus his scholarly daughter, Lady Jane Grey. Both received praise from Heinrich Bullinger for effusive Latin dedications. Well, once Gray, Jane Grey's coerced ventureship in, uh, venture in queenship was crushed by the Lady Mary's coup d'etat in 1553, Zurich became the most welcoming of hosts for shell-shocked English Protestants. And on the return to England uh, uh, in Elizabeth I's reign, they provided most of the first bishops in her restored Protestant Church of England. They fostered decades of close relationships with that Alpine city so far away. And they made Queen Elizabeth's Church of England resemble the Church of Zurich much more than the Church of Geneva. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. Well, this has been a complex tale to tease out, founded on sideways glances, glimpses of relationships. Yet it is perhaps the most important story in Cromwell's career. It's dependent on seeing how his early service to the second Marquis and Marchioness of Dorset in the 1520s meshed with links into the Kentish upper gentry and a common disposition not just to Protestant religion but to the crystallising identity of that form of Protestantism later called Reformed. 
And we must remember, too, how that same Kentish gentry cousinage spread outwards to embrace both leaders of Edward VI's government, Edward Seymour and John Dudley. They were, in effect, both Kentish Cromwellians. Quietly, with extraordinary discretion, Cromwell encouraged friends and household to support an enterprise of international theological matchmaking with no immediate strategic relevance and which would have aroused the suspicion and rage of King Henry if he had fully known about it. No cynical, secular-minded politician would have taken such risks. Cromwell was deliberately laying foundations for a Protestant future and a reformed Protestant future. England's future course towards the reformed Protestant side of the European Reformation, away from Lutheranism, can already be foreshadowed in that year or so of Cromwell's not noble household service in 1523. What followed in the 1540s was what Alec Ryrie has called the strange death of Lutheran England. And I remind you of that phenomenon of the Italian Reformation which we met in my first lecture. Nicodemism, the practice of religion in which much that was outward did not reflect that which was inward. Thomas Cromwell's religion was Nicodemite. But it was a peculiar sort of Nicodemism because it ran alongside and contributed to the Reformation which he went on to promote openly and aggressively in the name of Henry VIII during the 1530s. It was hidden in plain sight alongside the dissolution of the monasteries and the establishment of an official English Bible. Its permanent results became apparent only after his death in reformations under Edward VI and Elizabeth, which decisively parted company with Lutheranism and joined the reformed Protestant church's family. And these later developments of the English Reformation also fulfilled many long-standing Lollard hopes, including the destruction of sacred imagery and the promotion of a reformed sacramental theology that old King Henry had murderously loathed. Because of this posthumous result, Cromwell's religious program must count as the most successful Nicodemite enterprise of the entire European Reformation. When Elizabeth I came to the throne in 1558, permanently restored Protestantism as the kingdom's religion, she had good reason to detest the nexus of politicians with Cromwell at their center. They had first destroyed her mother, and then tried to divert the succession from herself and her half-sister. Yet, she was irreversibly tied to them in her role as Europe's leading Protestant monarch. And like Cromwell, she was herself a Nicodemite who had kept quiet about her Protestantism during her sister's return to Roman Catholicism. And at least some of the old resentments fell away when she was drawn into an intimate and indeed passionate relationship with John Dudley's son, Robert. But quite apart from Robert Dudley's place as favorite and leading counselor, much else bound her to the Protestant elite of her father's court. That produced the Elizabethan settlement of religion. Well, the Italian reform of the Spirituali and their Nicodemite fellow travelers was in the 1540s and 1550s exposed, crushed, and scattered abroad by the Counter-Reformation to diffuse into Central European reformed Protestantism and into the varied Unitarianism of Eastern Europe. But Thomas Cromwell's Nicodemite version of reformed Protestantism thus endured under the tutelage of his most accomplished imitator, Queen Elizabeth I, after 1559, it became the Church of England. Thomas Cromwell did so much in a decade. He served his king with careful attention to what Henry wanted, but an even more careful attention to insinuating his own plans and hopes into the king's proceedings. Partly, he wanted to forward a religious revolution. Partly, his aim was more predictably to forward his own family's dignity in the realm. And his success in that respect was astonishing. 
the grandson of a Putney brewer, married the sister-in-law of a king. It was hardly surprising that some believed Thomas Cromwell capable of planning a marriage to the king's daughter, Mary. Now, what an alteration that would have made to history. The actual alteration was profound enough. Not just the break with Rome, which had sprung from King Henry's ego, but a committed Protestantism for Edwardian and then Elizabethan England, steered by men who'd profited from Cromwell's patronage and guidance from noblemen like John Dudley, Edward Seymour, and Henry Gray, to civil servants and lawyers as diligent and talented as Cromwell himself, Elizabeth's trusted servants, Nicholas Bacon and William Cecil. Protestant England endured, gradually outstripping the great powers which in the Tudor age made England seem marginal in Europe. Protestant England took a new, steadily more dominant place on the world stage, as Thomas Cromwell's namesake and collateral descendant Oliver won victories in ocean-wide warfare against the popish power of Spain. Lord Protector Oliver had at his disposal the National Navy, once the pride of old King Henry. Henry had spent so much of his wealth on it, mostly gained lately at the expense of the church. The Kingdom of England, restored in 1660, built on Oliver Cromwell's achievements, in partnership with a now Protestant Scotland. The new alliance named itself Great Britain in 1707. Implausibly, for a small archipelago, it created a great seaborne world empire that rose and fell from the 17th to the 20th centuries, even in my own lifetime. And that imperial story lies behind the formation of another Protestant world power, whose time may similarly pass, the United States of America. This, and much else, for better or worse, remains the legacy of Thomas Cromwell. Thank you. <laughs>